Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Dentists depend more on auxiliary personnel than ever before to operate their practices efficiently. As a result, they expect a maximum performance from each employee. At the same time, dental auxiliaries expect recognition for their efforts and job satisfaction. A management technique called performance planning has been developed to satisfy the expectations of both the employer and the employees. Here to discuss performance planning is Tess Kirby, a management development associate with the Human Resources Development Department at the University of Michigan Hospital. Tess, is personnel management really a matter of mutual understanding? Oh, it's a critical, critical factor if you want to have effective personnel management. Do you uh, think that this is lacking in organizations? Oh, again, the answer is most assuredly yes. I think that quite often managers think of their function as a one-way communications function, uh, whereas really the mutual understanding and a two-way communication is really what can help people effectively reach their goals, motivate people, allow themselves to be motivated, really accomplish what an office or an institution is there to do. Now, how does this performance planning technique fit in here? Is it uh, geared to this business of developing uh, an understanding of what the employer expects on the part of the employee? That's a piece of it. Again, this is a communications tool. It is for better understanding, first of all, of just the areas that you consider employees accountable of what you expect them to do to reach the goals of those areas, uh, the kinds of activities you expect them to participate in, as well as the objectives that you have for them to reach. There is a third component here, and it's telling them or laying out you two agreeing how they are to be evaluated on these different objectives and activities in these areas of responsibility. Does the employee have any involvement in the development of those expectations? According to my thoughts, ideally, yes, they do. There are several different ways that a performance plan can be developed. One can be that, that say it's your office and you as Dr. Chastine sit down and decide what you feel are the major areas of responsibility for each employee, what kinds of activities you expect them to perform, what objectives you want them to reach, and what kind of measures you feel are reasonable. The difficulty with this is there's no give and take between you and the employee. And one of the nice things about performance planning is it creates a climate. It promotes the kind of atmosphere where there can be mutual understanding, mutual talking. If you just come and plunk this in front of me and say, here, Tess, you as my employee, this is what I expect of you, I have no chance to buy into that. I either take what you say or don't take what you say. Isn't it true that the, the manager, in this case the dentist, uh, in a dental practice, uh, just might not understand the intricacies of that task so that the individual uh, couldn't uh, succeed at the task? Very, very much so. We all have a different perspective, and a person who is managing a group, of course, must have a different perspective than the group that's being managed. So I, I don't want to call it a technique, but the process that I much prefer is that, again, you're my employer, Dr. Chastain, I'm your auxiliary. We come together and decide what are my major areas of responsibility. What do you hold me accountable for? Then I go back as the employee and try and write out the activities that I think must take place to deal with that major area of responsibility, the kinds of objectives I think that are appropriate. I also lay out the kind of measurements that I think you should use to evaluate me. This does a couple of 
very interesting things. Number one, I as employee must very carefully look at my job. What are the constraints? What can I do? What can I expect myself to do? What do I need from you? What do I need from other external sources? I bring this to you. You as my employer get a very interesting perspective. You get to see the job as I see it from my point of view. A rarity, I think, in this day and age that because we don't sit and do these things back and forth. Is this a uh, verbal activity is it, or is it a written uh, agreement between the, the dentist and the dentist staff? It's written because, quite frankly, most of us don't remember what we said two days ago. We think we understood, but we're not entirely sure. So it does two things. First of all, it gets it down so everybody remembers what we said. And also, it's down on paper so everyone, again, can have this mutual understanding that this is what it means to me. Is that what it means to you, Dr. Chastain, my boss? And we once again can agree on the written word. It seems to me that, that dentists or people in management positions really want to nurture success in their employees for the good of the organization, for their own uh, interpersonal relationship. A happy employee is more pleasant to work with and certainly uh, more productive in most instances, I would suspect. Uh, and it, performance planning is, sounds like it's slanted in that direction. Am I correct in that? Oh, uh, what this does is it allows the employee, you might say, a piece of the action. Motivational theory, uh, common motivational theory, shows that if I can be a part of determining how I spend my time, controlling my environment, you might say. Uh, and also, you know, 40 hours a week is the time that an employer and employee supposedly come together. That can color the whole rest of one's life. Let's say you are managing a group that is not happy. As you well know, your spare hours can be spent really being distressed over that situation. Same thing for employees. So this is, in motivation, if I can buy into determining the goals that I have, laying out what's important, being heard is a very, very important motivational tool, if you want to call it that. Um, this allows me to feel like I am truly contributing something valuable on this job. You are listening to me. And I, again, have some control over what I do. Do you think that performance planning helps to reduce turnover and, and even on a daily basis uh, conflict between not only the dentist and the auxiliaries, but uh, the auxiliaries one to another that might be in the group of, uh, that compromise the, uh, uh, the staff or compose the staff, rather? Yeah, you speak of both turnover and conflict management. Again, we all like to know where we stand. What this lays out, it is a mutual understanding of the expectations. It's been a mutual setting of these expectations, let alone an understanding. Therefore, it is not an unstable environment in which someone then works. And I think one of the major causes of turnover, one can be um, an unstable environment. You do not know where you stand, how you stand, what's expected of you. A lot of time, unfortunately, is spent by employees wondering, now, am I supposed to do this? Does he want me to? How, do, how am I supposed to do this? A lot of questioning. This way it's laid right out. People know exactly what's expected, what's going to be looked at when they decide if this has, in fact, been done well or not. One of the built-in pieces when you spoke of conflict management, two things can come out of this. First of all, you mentioned among employees. Yes, everybody's performance plan is shared by others. None of these things are a secret. That way, people see the work is divided in such a way. This is the way I fit together in the group. This is why I'm important to the group. This is why my services are, are necessary to be done in this way. Once again, you know, again, psychological theory, we want to think well of ourselves. If we feel that we fit into this piece of the puzzle in an important fashion, once again, it's just success begets success. And if we feel good about ourselves, we'll do more things that will add to that. One other piece of this whole business is something we call ongoing progress review or feedback. 
you don't simply write a plan with an employee and then tuck it away in a drawer and do nothing with it from there on in, except occasionally peek and say what a good piece of writing we did. One thing that we ask you to do is constant feedback to the person. Feedback is keeping something on track. That's what we're asking you to do. You're doing these things well. I have some concerns here. How do you think we can go about fixing this? Both positive and negative feedback. Definitely. You always want to keep the good in the performance, uh, and you want to fix the concerns. If you don't lay out what the merits are in the performance, if you say to someone, for instance, I may say to you, uh, Joe, the way you seat patients, uh, boy, it's just not what it ought to be. You may well be doing three things correctly, two things incorrectly, but you're going to change all of them because I haven't been specific enough in what I, I want you to keep and what I'd like you to change. This whole process sounds to me like, like a, a contract of sorts between the employer and the employee to, to establish for a given time period, these are my expectations, the employee has input into that, the, mm -hmm. this is what I'd like to get out of this work relationship. And then you write it down, and at some point in time, you have feedback on that. Am, am I correct in understanding the process? That's correct, excepting the some point in time. I look at ongoing progress review as almost a daily occurrence. If, if you are watching this employee perform and they're doing well, say so. Again, this is a communications tool. If there is a cause for concern, say so immediately. This isn't a formalized um, feedback, but rather in passing or as you're in the work relationship. I mean, exactly. Right. There is a space for the formalized review period. I frankly like it at least every six months. And again, this is just a time when you and the employee sit down together, taking this plan, take a look. Has the person met their objectives, exceeded their objectives, not met their objectives? What can you do to make their job easier? How can they reach these objectives? Are the measures fair? Do the areas of responsibility need to be changed? Again, it's a review of the performance um, in a very crunched form. I mean, you sit there for a couple of hours and discuss this with the person with no interruptions, and it is a very nice way to summarize what's gone on during the year. I might add there should be no surprises at this time. The employee should have heard everything all along the way, this is just a nice way to summarize where you're all standing. Tess, I'd like to take and develop with you, if we could, a sample performance plan, if we could, right after this important message. Tess, I'd like to develop a performance plan for a typical dentist, dental assistant uh, working relationship and uh, so our audience can see exactly how such a plan is developed, if you would. I think that's an excellent idea. We could, of course, not come up with an entire plan in the time frame we have, but I think if we could work even with one example, then people can get more of an idea of the kinds of things we're talking about. So can you give me an example of what you would consider a major area of responsibility for an auxiliary. Remember, this is something that you hold this person accountable for the activity. Well, there are numerous activities and areas of responsibility a dental assistant would have in a uh, contemporary dental office. Uh, I would think that radiography would be one issue. A uh, person is responsible for uh, exposing radiographs and processing them. And, uh, All right labeling, filing, that sort of thing. Okay, good. Then what, frankly, the way you can even do this, you just take a blank sheet of paper. One thing that's very nice is that on the left-hand side, if you put down what the major area of responsibility is, then in a column in the center, list the activities and objectives for that major area of responsibility. And then in the third column at the very end, put down the measures or how you would evaluate whether this person has in fact met, exceeded, or not met these objectives. So well, what would you say would be a good way to phrase 
over in the left-hand column what this major area of responsibility concerning radiography is. Uh, I would say expose and process dental radiographs. Okay. Expose. All right, that's good. Now, what are some activities and some objectives you expect this person to reach concerning this ar area? I would expect them to expose uh, the various uh, views that we would require in uh, an x-ray survey of a patient correctly. Okay, what do you mean by correctly? Using the technique that I would like to use in my office, that would be the paralleling technique. All right, I think it would be wise if this is something that you would expect and wish that is put into your specifications. Be specific on what you want. So exposed periapical and bite wing radiographs and using the paralleling technique. Yes, that sounds specific and clear. I think if I were walking into your office, I would understand what you are asking me to do. Or if I'm an auxiliary, that sounds like a reasonable thing that I would expect to do when dealing with radiographs. Okay. okay. Is it then we need to measure them? Yeah. You can either do your measures now or you can do them after you lay out all the objectives, uh, whichever you prefer. How would you measure whether this was done correctly? The things that I would be concerned about would be the end result, the, the accuracy of the product and the safety that was related you know, to the process. In other words, I would okay. want the auxiliary to, to, to do this in a safe manner to protect the patient from radiation and protect the auxiliary from radiation, and I would okay. want a very accurate result. All right. I guess I need to ask you, how are you going to measure if this has been done safely concerning both patient and auxiliary, and how do you measure whether it's an accurate result? Do you have a built-in system? I think in terms of safety, it would have to be by observation. Do they stand behind the barriers that okay. are provided? for radiation hygiene? Do they use a lead apron uh, for the patient uh, to give the okay. patient maximum uh, protection? Do they use proper exposure times? Good. That sort of All thing right. can be done by observation. Okay, I think that then you need to lay that out. Something I ask for in measures. We ask that they be fair and relevant. Um, I also ask you to cite every source from which you will be gleaning information, the who, what, why, when, and where. If you entertain uh, comments from your patients, for instance, about this sort of situation. Lay that out. Say, I will listen to those, or I will solicit information from patients, or your peers, or other dentists. This sort of thing, let, let them know exactly what you're going to be looking at. So in this arena, it will be your observation of them protecting the patient and themselves, as well as an expected level of accuracy on these X-rays. Can you give me an expected level? Well, uh, in a 14-film survey, I would certainly uh, like to have absolute accuracy, but uh, because of variability, that is not always possible in every case. Uh, I would certainly uh, expect something like uh, no more than one film out of 14 uh, to be faulty in any way, which would be about 95% okay. uh, accuracy. Right. owing to some variability in the patient. Mm -hmm. How would you know this? Well, after radiographs are taken, processed, and mounted, uh, obviously they're taken for purposes of diagnosis, and you'd look at them. The dentist would look at them for purposes of diagnostic uh, uh, evaluation, mm -hmm. and at okay. that time, uh, any faulty uh, product would be identified. What happens with this, by the way, is you have delineated one arena out of many for a dental auxiliary. By the way, you can approach this in, in a couple of different fashions. You can do this individually with each auxiliary. And if their duties, chores, etc., are different, then I would think that would be a wise move. On the other hand, if all of the auxiliaries do the same types of activities and you have the same expectations, the same measures, perhaps working this out as a group would be very useful because you get a lot of input that way. It was interesting as you quizzed me about this um, area of responsibility and developed this performance plan, it forced me to think through on the spot 
what I expected of that auxiliary, mm -hmm. and then how I was going to measure that. Right. And I you will have helpful. that input. I, as an auxiliary, let's say, will come in with my plan. You get to see my perspective on this whole business, too. And something you need to keep in mind, one of performance planning is an excellent communications tool, but it is something else, too. It's sort of a very soft um, management by objectives technique. You, as a person running an office, have an umbrella. You have a goal you want to reach. These plans then all fit in under that goal. That is the whole idea, is to reach the larger goal that you have established. And there's no guesswork between the dentist and the dental auxiliaries. No. And there's no energy lost in me trying to figure out what do you want from me and did I do it right, and didn't I do it right, and am I supposed to be doing that or am I supposed to be doing that? It's very clear cut, a com very comfortable kind of situation. Earlier you mentioned the business of constant feedback, even small comments on a daily basis perhaps. Mm -hmm. You mentioned at that time that there is a formal review period. That's correct. What did you mean by that? Again, as I said, I prefer it every six months to set time aside to sit down and discuss the performance plan. Now, a way that this has been approached that seems most effective, first of all, you are my boss, I'm the auxiliary. You, you say, Tess, I would like to make an appointment with you in a week to review your performance plan. This way I can prepare and you can prepare. By prepare, by the way, I mean I am expecting that you have a lot of supportive information when you start dealing with the review of this performance plan. Documentation has sort of a punitive sound to it. I prefer calling it supportive information, but what I ask of people is to please keep a folder on each employee, tucking in examples of good performance. If there was a conflict or a difficulty, document that, tuck that in there, so that you have a balanced view of what this person has done over the last six months. It's very difficult to remember what someone did in July, it's December, and let's say they've been performing outstandingly the last two months. You vaguely remember there were some difficulties six months before. Put it down. It's something that this person, first of all, should have heard about then, and then in the summary time, you can say, in the first two months we had difficulties, you improved in the next two months as evidenced by and you've got your documentation there, and you've really come up to standard these last two months. Is it true that, that we tend to remember the more negative aspects of employees or other people than the positive ones? Does this help to, by documenting uh, these pieces of information, supportive information, uh, does it help us maintain a perspective uh, on employees to, to shy away from the negative things uh, you know, and, and keep a balance? Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. Now, some people only remember the positive things. They don't like unpleasant things. Therefore, we don't deal with unpleasant things, hoping they'll go away. Doesn't go away. So, yes. So you have to... You need the balance. The balance, yes. You really, what you're trying to do is give a very accurate reflection of this person's behavior over the last six months. Very tough to do that even... I'm sure that we couldn't look at one of our own children and say what they did six months ago. We're kind of colored by what's happening within the last couple of weeks. So very important to do that. We're in this review session now. We have the documented material that we've made notes and um, comments in a, in a little notebook or diary. Uh, mm -hmm. I assume that this is kept uh, in a confidential thing away from other employees and oh, so forth. Oh, very much so, certainly. I think that's probably a given. And now we're, we're counseling with the employee. Well, again, counseling has kind of a, a negative connotation. You are simply sitting down, sharing, again, the information that you have both accumulated over the last six months. A technique that I like very much. In fact, there are two things that you might want to do. I like to have a summary statement written at the end of this meeting, this coming together, the formal review process stating again in terms of someone has met, exceeded, not met objectives, not they were very nice last week, but really laying out precisely how they did do in relation to their plan. One thing that you well might be able to do is a technique that's been very well utilized 
is, let's say you're my employer, you say, Tess, I will expect from you in one week a summary statement of this meeting from your perspective. That way you get to hear exactly what I heard in this meeting and you get to see my perspective. The second thing I encourage one to do is, again, you're my employer, I'm the employee, have me go through my plan and say, a major area of responsibility was thus and so, and in these objectives, I think I exceeded these, met these, and didn't meet this one because. And then it's time for discussion on why not, what can we do, all of this sort of thing. That would also lead to some training, perhaps, going to continuing well education be. courses or in-office in training uh, or uh, identification of, of some problems that prevented that person from achieving that. Precisely. Test. It may be something that you need to do for them. A favorite question uh, that I have heard in these kinds of sessions is, what do you need from me? And uh, in this kind of a situation, the employer is a resource. And it is not the kind of controlling thing where you say, all right, you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and you do this. It's the talking back and forth. What happens is that it's not such a, what do you call it, boss-centered situation where you're like in the control tower running things around, not getting any feedback. In this situation, it's a mutual sharing, mutual understanding. Therefore, it's not really centered around you. You're not the only one who knows the game plan. Everybody knows the game plan. Their input is just as important as yours, and you are a resource at that point. Looking at the negative side of things, uh, we have to realize that not all working relationships uh, are good, despite these efforts, and that someone may have to be terminated from an organization, it seems to me that the performance plan would help that uh, process in terms of identifying why this work relationship is not uh, successful, Precisely. why the person uh, has to be terminated, and uh, in dealing with uh, unemployment and uh, the Employment Security Commission process of documentation mm -hmm. of work performance, that all of that would be more readily available for the dentist uh, should termination uh, be the only uh, possibility in that exactly. work relationship. Yes, and it removes some of the muddiness. I think any of us who've had to fire someone get this kind of feeling in the back of our head. If we don't have very solid documentation, it's, well, was I right in doing that? Was I a little too hard on him? Was I fair enough? What did I ask too much? All of these kinds of considerations. You have it laid right out in front of you. You've got the documentation that matches, so you don't need to get that uneasy feeling that goes with that situation. Sounds like performance planning could prevent a lot of problems. Oh, most assuredly, it certainly can. Thank you, Tess, for your interesting comments. Our guest has been Tess Kirby from the Human Resources Development Department at the University of Michigan Hospital. We invite you to join us for other programs in the By Design series as we look at current topics and trends in the management of a modern dental practice. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.